I, I'm going to interrupt to introduce Susan Reverby. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's an honor and a delight to do that. Um, uh, professor Susan Reverby is the Marion Butler McLean Professor in the History of Ideas um, uh, Emerita and Professor of Women's and Gender Studies at Wellesley College and an historian of American women, medicine, and nursing. Uh, the first hire at Wellesley in women's studies uh, was back in 1982. And uh, this was uh, Professor Re Reverby. Um, she was taught at the college, she taught at the college for about three decades. Um, Susan Reverby is the co-editor of America's Working Women, a documentary history of a book entitled Healthcare in America, Essays in Social History, another book entitled Gender Domains Beyond the Public and Private in Women's History. She's also the editor of the History of American Nursing, which is a 32 volume reprint series. And her prize winning book was called Ordered to Care, The Dilemma of American Nursing. It's still considered one of the major overview histories of American nursing. Uh, Professor Re Reverby uh, has also published two books and what is referred to as the infamous Tuskegee Syphilis Study from 1932 to 1972, the longest running non-therapeutic research study in US history um, that, that involved the, the US Public Health Service and nearly 600 African-American men in the counties surrounding Tuskegee, Alabama. The men thought they were being treated rather than being studied um, for what they thought was bad blood. The study has become a central metaphor for distrust of the healthcare system and as the key example of unethical research. Um, Susan's uh, edited books relating to the Tuskegee study include Tuskegee Truths, Rethinking the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, and then a later book, Examining Tuskegee, the infamous syphilis study and its legacy. I, I, I could go on and on uh, about- I'm about just old. <laughs> using, uh, amazing performances and work and background and training. Um, she, she's currently the Affirmative Action Officer of the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, served as its board of, on its board of directors since 1998. The title of Susan Re Reverby's talk today is Escaping Melodrama, How to Think or Not Think About the US Public Health Studies in Tuskegee and in Guatemala. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to welcome Susan Reverby. Susan, thank, you. thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to um, do the share screen thing so I can get my uh, slides up for you. I'll be right with you. Hold on. Dink, dunk, dunk. Share. University of Chicago. Okay, hold on. I'm going to move this over and slideshow. Um, play from start. Voila. Okay, all set? You can see it. Okay, great. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really. Um, only sorry that I can't physically be there so we could all go out afterward and um, get to know each other a little bit better. So I appreciate the Zoom opportunity nevertheless. So here we go. As the vaccine rollout for COVID-19 began earlier um, this year, concern for what was being labeled vaccine hesitancy started to fill the commentaries and news stories by the thousands. Much of it focused at first not on white Republicans in the so-called red states, but on the seeming irony of those concerns in African-American communities most hard hit with illness and deaths in this pandemic. For once, history seemed to be the explanation for these worries. In some ways, of course, this made sense. After all, when confronted with an individual patient's medical concerns, healthcare practitioners take a history with relevant questions to come in to a diagnosis and propose therapies. What are the symptoms? When did they start? How are they manifested? When Black Americans present their medical concerns as a population, however, 
The wrong questions are often asked, an inadequate history is taken, and the diagnosis and the treatment plan often fails. COVID proved this yet again. But as Voltaire noted in the 18th century, we owe respect to the living. To the dead, we only owe the truth. I therefore want to discuss from my own experiences how the preconceived assumptions of melodramatic history, and I'll explain that in a minute, that link medical research to racial topics makes our truth seeking difficult. To paraphrase and change Voltaire a bit, we cannot provide respect to the living if we do not provide truth to the dead. Some of my scholarship, as Dr. Siegler has pointed out, has focused on two troubling studies in the American medical research history. The US Public Health Service study of untreated syphilis in the male Negro, better known as the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, 1932 to 72, for which then President Clinton apologized in 1997. So this is the edited book of documents about the study. And then this is the book I actually wrote about how to think about um, the study and what happened. And the other work focuses on something called the US Public Health Inoculation Sexually Transmitted Diseases Studies in Guatemala that took place between 1942 and 48 that received worldwide attention in 2010. And I'll explain this in a minute. And this is the cover of the major paper in Guatemala City um, in 2010. A US government apology to Guatemala. Here's the story in the Times. Here's the 200 page report from the president's um, Bioethics Commission in September 2011. Each of these studies involved the powerful US government focused on primarily poor and rural African American men in one case, and Guatemalan sex workers, mental patients, soldiers, and prisoners in the other. Each entailed deception, lack of any serious consenting processes, and life threatening sexually transmitted infections. The study in Tuskegee, as you know, went on for four decades as hundreds of African-American men without the disease were watched, but not supposed to be treated. So this is a photo of a woman named Eunice Rivers, I can discuss later, who's the go-between the men in the public health service, handing out a packet of aspirins to one of the men in the study. This is Rivers handing out vitamin tonics and aspirins in one of the cotton fields. The diagnostic spinal taps were done as a, um, and, and the men were promised that they were being given a special treatment. And then the term bad blood was used, but here's a poster from the New York State, New York City actually uh, prisons that I found that was put up in the thirties um, that used, that said bad blood means it is syphilis. The study in Guatemala extended for two years, recruited nearly 1500 men and women. Here's my report on that. Um, just over 2,000, according to the Guatemalan government's report, and involved infecting, which Tuskegee did not, I'll talk about that in a second, with syphilis, gonorrhea, and chancroid, and then not treating the majority of them after the infecting. Each study, of course, conjures up almost primordial and powerful fears of our lack of control over our own bodies, the dangers of those with great power, the terror of trusting physician scientists to respond with what many see as close to medical torture, the racism of treating people of color as the other, both in our own South and in the global South. So here's a quickie uh, comparison. Let me just move this out of the way here. Hold on just a second. Uh, the two studies. So Guatemala people are being given STIs. Um, not all the subjects are given penicillin, even if they invinced infection. Not everyone became infected. We're not sure about the numbers. The study was kept secret, but the records are in John Cutler's archives. I'll describe this in a sec. And in Tuskegee, the men already had syphilis, were mostly in late latency. Um, they were supposed to be kept from treatment, although not always successfully. And there were published reports about this, more, about a 13 altogether, actually. The men are referred to as volunteers, for example. Um, each of these research projects has physical procedures that are pretty horrific and pornographic almost. Diagnostic spinal taps described as special treatment in Tuskegee, and the use of sex workers' spinal punctures and the abrading of men's penises and women's cervixes to deliver the disease inoculums in Guatemala. Now, a historian finds the facts for these studies in the multiple and usual ways, reading primary materials in archives, interviews, statistical data, et cetera. We often don't know what meaning we or others will make of the material once we have it. For of course, in part, it depends on what kind of narrative we create, 
what existing tropes we struggle for or against, and the kinds of facts we both find and explain. None of this, however, has ever been easy, especially in the face of strong beliefs about what the stories are supposed to be about and the seeming obvious bioethical lessons to be derived. I'm also more than aware as a white Northern woman analyzing histories in which racism and or imperialism undergird the studies I'm researching, I need to make them central to my analysis even when I try and make the ways they work complex and nuanced. If I don't name racism and imperialism over and over as some kind of mantra, it's assumed I'm either callous or thoughtless from the left. Um, hold on, why is this not moving? Just a sec. Okay, uh, there we go. This is me getting into a fight with Amy Goodman on democracy now. <laughs> and if I mention them at all, the right thinks I'm an ideologue, I don't have a slide of the veiled death threat I got on my Amazon author page. Given rumors and other explanations too, my efforts require acknowledging and knowing what the beliefs are already, as even I try and say what else might be known. And in the face of a media onslaught over these horrific issues, the difficulties of remaining the careful, thoughtful academic, who always wants to say things of course are more complex, became even harder. And now in the face of the use of at least the study in Tuskegee to explain what's happening with vaccines, it's become even more difficult. The best example of the way Tuskegee, for example, has entered popular culture can be seen on these two Saturday Night Live um, uh, skits. Um, the first one um, was in 2006 and involved Kenan Thompson and you, Laurie, in which the white doctor comes in and offers the patient help for his broken leg and Laurie and Thompson look at each other and start yelling, it's Tuskegee, Tuskegee, over and over again. Um, and in this past spring in 2000, uh, actor Daniel Kalua was trying to convince his family to take the COVID vaccine. Let me see if my, oh, it didn't come up again, darn. So he, he basically is talking to, I'll just walk you through this one. Um, he's talking to his family. It's a kind of pretend quiz show. And he says to his, to a cousin, why won't you do this? And he's, and she says, well, does it have syphilis in it? And he said, well, why would it have syphilis in it? And she says, um, Tuskegee, and he said, but that was a long time ago. And then the next cousin says, well, I'm not gonna do it if, unless white people do it. And he says, well, I don't trust white people. And then, the, and then he says, well, why don't you trust white people? And um, the cousin says, Tuskegee. So you see it over and over again being used in this kind of um, circumstance. So how then was it possible to discuss this and how should I have tried? I found some comfort in thinking through the problems of melodramas, spectacles, and tragedies as a way to understand my experiences. I found particularly useful this um, wonderful quote from the late film director, Sidney Lumet. He said, in a well-written drama, the story comes out of the characters. The characters in a well-written melodrama come out of the story that is in a melodrama, we already know what's gonna happen. The characters just fill in the blanks, but when you, try to write history, of course, you wanna be writing a drama where our historical figures create the story, of course, in historical context, not melodramas where we already know the story and the characters just fill in. When it comes to public discussions and fictional representations of racism and imperialism, especially in the context of medical research, however, it's often the melodrama where the story drives the characters. Film critic Linda Williams provides a guide here, I thought, in her analysis of the melodramas of race that get seen in America in both actual experiences in books, plays, and films. Her, her book was called Playing the Race Card, came out about 10 or 15 years ago. These kinds of melodramas, she says, are embedded in our national consciousness and they're almost impossible to escape. Williams contends that these kinds of simple spectacles and tragedies performed in melodramatic tones are the ways we talk, view, and organize our thinking about race, even when we think we're not doing it and even when we want to escape it. For she suggests that the cross-racial recognition of virtue arises and the demand for citizenship becomes founded not on an understanding of rights, but on victimhood. She then explores the limitations of this approach to the body politic. I first realized that this kind of concept of melodrama would be a problem when I began to lecture on the initial work I was doing on the study in Tuskegee nearly 25 years ago. 
I was confounded with the belief, and this is the major um, misbelief about the study, that the men in the study were given syphilis by the US Public Health Service, not the disease already. And note, for example, in the, in the SNL clip, when the cousin says, does the vaccine have syphilis in it? That idea has now traveled into the assumption that you're being given a disease. The belief is, belief is enforced, of course, when there's an image of the blood draws. Now you can tell by looking at this picture that the physician has his hand on the syringe and he's pulling it out, he's doing a blood draw. But I'll show you another picture in a minute where it gets cropped and you can't tell um, what's going on. So even if it's this hand or here's Nurse Rivers doing it as well, um, the assumption is that they're being given the, um, the um, they're being given something rather than having a blood draw. To understand why this belief about um, infecting still circulates is to accept that the study never was, from its very first public exposure in 90, 1972, just an historical event or even just a bioethics tale. It became almost an American allegory, a way to explain the dangers and fears that lurk every time a patient or subject places their lives in someone else's hands, whether for clinical care or a research trial. And as a way, I think also to speak about racism without directly naming it. There's a reason some of the earliest horror stories and films focused on the dangers of unchecked medical madness and sexualized power of doctors over the innocent. So think about the cabinet of Dr. Kilgari, the Island of Lost Souls or Frankenstein. The assumption of infecting with a potentially deadly disease in this study fits these old tropes. The monster doctors are infecting or endangering the vulnerable is a powerful tale. Even if failing to treat and deception, as was done in Tuskegee, I have argued, is in some ways even more normative and in many ways more horrible and even more racist for its familiarity of people's inability to get appropriate care. For the study in Tuskegee, along with slavery and lynching, becomes yet another example of what happens when African Americans are not um, valued as rights bearing citizens. So, this is just a, I love this picture of three of the men in the study. It's just such a great 50s picture. Um, and here's another group of the men who were in the study. In retelling the story, I relied upon interviews, statistical data from the men's medical records that opened up, and a rereading of the correspondence to argue that many actually escaped to some treatment, especially if they survived into the antibiotic era. By the end of the study and before its public exposure, the PHS researchers had to admit to one another it had become a study of undertreated, not untreated syphilis. My historical counting tried to show that even Mr. Herman Shaw, there's not picture of the man, this Mr. Shaw at the Apology in 1997, got himself to treatment in the 1950s. And here are five of the men who were, there were six of them still alive in 1997 when we got the Apology in Washington and all of the men have now passed and all of their wives are now passed. The story, of course, of undertreatment and the possibility of escape, however, cannot balance against the revulsion, and nor should it in some ways, toward a government that knowingly let its citizens be harmed and even wrote about it in 13 published articles over the decades. My evidence and argument is a way we can rethink the meaning of the study as a metaphor for genocide and the ways the research community might come to remember that subjects can undermine their, quote, scientific results in hidden ways. Such an understanding is difficult to counter the powerful melodrama or the simple ease of a simple victim story that's become the basis for federal rulemaking, online ethics courses, and now really part of the national conversation on mistrust. The problem of trying to escape a kind of medical melodrama became even clearer as the news of the Guatemala study became a worldwide phenomena. I was in the archives at the University of Pittsburgh in 2003 to examine the papers of a former Surgeon General and was told there were papers there of John C. Cutler, who had taught at Pitt for decades. So this is what Cutler looked like in 1946. Cutler was mostly at, at all at the end of a long list of names on several of the articles written about the syphilis study in Tuskegee, where he had worked in the 50s, a minor character in the story mostly remembered because with a pinched face, weird syntax and piercing eyes, he continued to defend the study as appropriate science and good for African-Americans on several documentaries made 20 years after the study was ended. So here, I think this one will run. Here's Cutler in 1992 in a film called Deadly Deception, asked whether he thinks the study that we should have apologized and whether or not the study should have ended. My regret is 
in terms of study, I have none. Uh, as a scientist, and say, one would like to have seen an ideal scientific study, but we're dealing with human beings over a long period of time, and, uh, and this is impossible. So this was stunning. And when we saw this film in 1992, it's actually the beginning of the organizing to get the federal, um, uh, this was in 94 when we saw the film and we organized for the next three years to get uh, Clinton to apologize. So I thought, oh, here's Cutler's papers. Maybe I'll find some more stuff on Tuskegee. And I opened his papers, hoping perhaps to find out more. Instead, I found thousands of pages, laboratory reports, experimental uh, uh, records and photographs with the cover that said, here's the cover page, um, experimental studies on human inoculation in syphilis, gonorrhea, gonorrhea and chancroid. And then there were all of these photos as an example. When I saw them, they were, you know, they didn't have the black thing that was done by the, um, the public, uh, the government. And that's Cutler, um, you know, in Guatemala. The papers were first studied, as far as I knew, no one had ever heard of. Remember, Tuskegee had 13 publications that took place in Guatemala between 46 and 48, when Cutler was only 31 years old and just four years out of medical school. Now, remember, I had spent years at this point explaining that no one was given syphilis in Tuskegee, and here was Cutler and inoculation. As I read the story, it became increasingly horrific. Here are the key facts I could glean from Cutler's report and the extensive correspondence left in his papers. The studies in Guatemala were approved by a syphilis section of the National Research Council as a grant to NIH and to the Guatemalan government. Its purpose was designed to obtain information about methods of prophylaxis against syphilis, increase understanding of the effects of penicillin, and to assist and a better understanding of false positive serological tests. So remember, this is 1948. We learned in 1943 that syphilis, early syphilis can be cured by penicillin. We still, penicillin is a new drug. It's so um, carefully um, serviced that, in fact, when patients were given it, sometimes their, their urine was then titrated out so they could recapture the penicillin. Um, so we didn't know. And so what he was trying to figure out, an important question, could penicillin work as a prophylaxis? Could you give it to someone a little bit like a plan B, right? They've had unprotected sex, they haven't evinced infection yet, but you give them this drug and then, wow, they never get sick. So it's a good scientific question um, to be asking. The question was, how do you do that research, right, with an STD? So uh, unlike Tuskegee, this study, of course, involved infecting. One of the reasons Guatemala was chosen was with an STD, how do you transmit? In Guatemala, prostitution was legal. And even more importantly, inmates in the federal penitentiary in Guatemala City were allowed to bring sex workers into the prison for their services. So Cutler and a man named Juan Funes, who was his co-investigator and the head of the Guatemala BD division, as SDIs were then called, recruited sex workers who already had STIs or they inoculated them with them. And then they used US taxpayer dollars to pay these women to ply their trade with the prisoners. Despite this, and even adding alcohol to mimic what Cutler called, and then I called my paper, normal exposure, the inmates were opposed to the many blood draws that followed and proved recalcitrant. Cutler and Funes began to do blood testing in an orphanage. After that, they moved on to the country's only mental asylum and an army barracks. Here, they began to make the inoculum from infected rabbits and street strains, and they began to inoculate the inmates and soldiers in a variety of ways, skin contact, direct injection, scarification and abrasion, cisternal punctures. The details were pretty horrendous, as were the photos, and here's the irony of this, taken by Elise Cutler, a Wellesley College alumna, uh, you know, of all the women's colleges in all the world, she ended up at mine, um, from the 1930s, and Cutler's spouse. So here are some pictures, this is where they're measuring the shanker on this man's penis, and here's a picture of measuring um, the shanker on the arm. At the asylum, um, they offered the, the asylum director who didn't really know what was going on, uh, Dilantin for the epileptics who are a large part of the population. They also bought, and this just really sounds like, you know, 15 beads um, and, and then for Manhattan, a refrigerator for their biologics, a motion picture projector that supplied the sole recreation for the inmates, metal cups, plates, and forks to supplement the completely inadequate supply. Individual subjects were offered cigarettes, an entire packet for inoculation, blood draws, or spinal taps, and a single cigarette 
for clinical observations. Here's a good example of one of the medical records, the circle things and handwriting is mine. So they scarified the man's penis. They used the nickel rabbit strain of the disease. They uh, uh, dripped the inoculum onto a pledgelet that they put on the man's penis for an hour and a half. So three different applications um, over the period of, of um, from 8.16 to 9.05 p.m. And then they removed the pledgelet at 9.44. Malaria specialist Robert Coatney, who had done prison malaria studies, visited the project in February of 47. In reporting to Cutler after he returned to the States, he explained that he had brought Surgeon General Thomas Perrin up to date and, quote, with a merry twinkle that came into his eye, Perrin said, you know, we couldn't do such an experiment in this country, you know, and it may be referring mostly to the use of sex workers, we're not sure, but it gives you a sense of their sense that they could go somewhere else and do this. They knew, of course, that they were on an edge for R.C. Arnold, who supervised Cutler, wrote him and said, I am a bit, in fact, more than a bit leery of the experiment with the insane people. They can't give consent, don't know what's going on. And if some goody organization got wind of the work, they would raise a lot of smoke. So I think the soldiers would be best or the prisoners can they can give consent. But of course, they never got consent. They're not. They didn't even ask um, for it. Um, the numbers are really um, depends on who. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry, because I'm tight. Um, the uh, the numbers are really uh, you know kind of wonky. We think this is the work that was done by a SDD specialist from Johns Hopkins who worked for the uh, the bio um, bioethics commission that the intentional exposure was at least thirteen hundred and eight people diagnostic tech testing obviously was in the 5,000s. And there were 83 deaths during the time period, but there's no evidence that any of those deaths were caused by the experiments. But you know, you can imagine how that story goes on. What then should the historian do with this? Without a research team trained, uh, trained in biostats, which both the CDC and the Presidential Commission on Bioethics had, and they spent months on this, I made the decision um, not to try to analyze the thousands of pages of very messy data. It was 2003 and I still had the Tuskegee data, which had just become available to code, uh, which I then did. And the book would take another five years to finish. Furthermore, Cutler claimed in his written report and in his correspondence, this has been a study to explore in part the use of penicillin and a, and a drug called Orvis Marfarsin as a prophylaxis. Thus coming to the material with my knowledge of the study in Tuskegee and the idea that this study, while involved infecting, also appeared to be one of treating, right, which is very different than Tuskegee. So without a careful analysis of the statistical materials, it was impossible to know if all the subject had or had not been treated. Even after all the research, the Bioethics Commission could not determine how many of the subjects actually became infected even, although they believe slightly more than half of those inoculated were left untreated. So there's some of their data that's all in the report. And here's what they said at the end of their report. I added the underline, the commission did not attempt to identify how many people were clinically infected or how many people received adequate treatment. As a result, the database focuses on the number of individuals exposed to rather than infected with an STD. So as a medical historian, I was also aware of the many inoculation studies that existed that historians already knew about. I kept thinking about historian Gert Brieger, may he rest in peace, we just lost him this last year, questions about how many horror stories did we really need to keep uncovering? I was of course horrified by the Guatemala materials and thought they would fit into the book on Tuskegee, but as a way to explain how difficult it was to actually infect people given the biology of the disease. I began quietly to discuss the Guatemala materials with others. However, when I finally finished the last edits on the book, the Guatemala material seemed too complicated and too unfresh in my mind. And so since I had been forced to cut 100 pages out of the book. So in June of 2009, the book on Tuskegee now done and my teaching response at least done for the year, I returned to the Pittsburgh archives and redid the research to be clear on what I had really found. Um, so given other teaching and service demands on my time, it took me until March of 2010 to write the Guatemala material up to plan to give it as a paper at the American Association of the History of Medicine that May. And here's the important part. I shared it with David Sensor, the former CDC director um, shown here on the right. That's a picture of him during the Tuskegee thing. And I'll tell that story in a minute. The former CDC director with whom I had become friends um, with as I interviewed him about Tuskegee. David had chaired a meeting in 1969, considered a crucial turning point in the Tuskegee story and had allowed the study to go forward and the men not to be treated. 
SDS, the Students for Democratic Society, which I had belonged in college, even burned him in effigy outside the CDC offices after the story of Tuskegee broke in 72. I told him I probably would have been there burning him if I had been in Atlanta. This time, I think, he was determined to do it right and to protect his former organization. So it was Censor who asked if he could give my yet unpublished paper. And I had asked him to read it because I'm not a physician. And as historians of medicine will tell you, if you get one medical thing wrong in a paper, the doctors jump all over you. So I always have a doctor check to make sure I didn't make some dumb medical mistake. And so David was my aging syphilologist. He was in his 80s. And I thought he could you know, read it and make sure I didn't make any medical errors. And he's the one who said, oh, my God, you've got to let me share this with the CDC. So what happened is it went up the chain of command in the summer of 2010 through the CDC up to the White House. And it went through these other um, players. Um, so this is Harold Jaffe on the left, who was the director of CDC for science. This is John Douglas on the bottom. He was the head of the STD division. And that's Zeke Emanuel, the uh, brother of your former mayor in Chicago, but who was then the point person for um, Obama um, there. So I agreed that we would put my unpublished paper up on my college website um, and that the government would issue um, a, an, um, a, an apology. So I put it on the, on the college website rather than on my book website. So I had the authority of the college behind me and it didn't appear like I was like shilling a book and also because there was nothing about Guatemala in the, in the Tuskegee books, so it seems sort of nuts. Now, most historians are trained not to write what if claims, but there are several worth considering now since I have been criticized in print for not releasing the material immediately in 2003. I didn't have any contact with David Sensor in 2003 and it took several years for that friendship to build up so we could trust one another. In 2003, I had just begun to write the book on Tuskegee, uh, though the edited book was out. And even if I had written the Guatemala material up in 2003, I didn't have the authority, I think, finishing the Tuskegee book would give me, um, nor an analysis that wouldn't have just made this one more horror story. And I had no contacts at CDC. So the story had legs in 2010 because of the apology from the US government, not just what I found. Without those contacts, I doubt it would have been picked up. And furthermore, Zeke Emanuel, uh, as I said, Obama's point person on healthcare, had written on the exploitation of subjects, was involved in proposals to chain regulations about human subject protection, just the doing gathering steam. And he knew who, my work. I think he pushed for the apology and thought about how it could be used. And finally, consider that what uh, we don't know whether or not during the Bush administration, anyone would have taken seriously the need to apologize for this or any bioethical commission investigation, even if it had been able to get anyone to pay attention. So it leaves us with the version of if an historian finds something in the archives and shouts out, will somebody listen? Do we have to have responsibly to blog everything substantial we find and hope it gets picked up? Should every historian have a governmental official on speed dial? What if I tried to publish this immediately? Would it have mattered? And then of course, how will we ever know? What I wasn't prepared for, of course, and although I should have been, was the melodrama that followed. By September, I knew that both Secretaries Clinton and Sebelius would be apologizing and that President Obama would be calling President Colomb in Guatemala. Colomb invoked the terms first used against the Armenian genocide and called the studies crimes against humanity. The president also asked his commission on bioethical issues to explore the history, as you know, and other human subject prote protections. I was stunned that it had taken us years to get the apology for the study in Tuskegee, and this happened, frankly, in a matter of months. I still wasn't sure it would make much coverage, so you sure don't want to go to Las Vegas with me because I mostly don't know how to bet properly. What I had not been told, however, was that the government had given the story to Robert Bazell, then NBC science correspondent, the night before and embargoed it. I agreed to post my uncopy edited article on my faculty webpage at nine o'clock on October 1st. Bazell already knew about it, had reported it on MSNBC by 9.02. By 9.05, he called me on my cell phone. And by 9.30, I had to get out of my pajamas because there was an NBC News crew <laughs> in my living room. And then the world's entire media started to call because like a dingbat, we had given my, my cell phone as the contact, not the PR agent person at Wellesley because nobody thought about this. So quickly it became very clear the press wanted to know one, how had this happened and how did I feel when I found it? And how monstrous really was Cutler? 
the PAHS doctor who had run the studies in Guatemala and which of course, which one was worse? I, had to, I was asked to vote literally the study in Tuskegee or Guatemala. And you can see how they get connected. So this was a sort of a, a, a TV show that was done in Australia and I got interviewed. So here's the picture on the left. This is the blood draw in Tuskegee, but you can see you couldn't really tell what's going on here. The gentleman lying here is in Guatemala. That's one of the, I was in these two pictures of, is of me looking very hot and bothered because it was like 95 degrees and we were in the cemetery in Tuskegee when this guy interviewed me. But you can see again how they get um, linked even by the title infected explanation point, right? So how did I feel? What kind of weird question I thought. Um, it, it's often felt a little bit like a kind of when did you stop beating your wife kind of question. When I said I was shocked that this kind of study had gone on, one reporter wrote that I was naive and didn't understand how normative this was for medicine. If I said it was not surprised, then I sounded as if I was callous and thoughtless. Others made me sound, I love this one, as if I was just some girl researcher who had accidentally found this material that was being hidden away, rather than a scholar who knew what she was looking at although obviously not for its current news value, and could write it up in a historically nuanced manner. No one seems to remember my favorite quote from Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind, right? Um, wasn't Cutler a Nazi doctor like Mengele, I got asked, who had found refuge in, in Latin America? I'm not the only one who thought this. This was a cartoon in Prensa Libre in, uh, um, in Guatemala City. So there's Uncle Sam looking in the mirror and you know, Mengele's looking back at him. I tried really hard to put Cutler in context to discuss the ways in which his higher ups were not so sure this was acceptable research, but it still let it go on. I tried to explain why the public health service was so concerned about syphilis and the search for chemical prophylaxis to prevent infection after exposure. The melodrama, however, provided a much more powerful story. Cutler became a Nazi doctor, although there was indeed some worry in Guatemala that there were many other issues to worry about. So I love this one. It's Mrs. Clinton apologizing to President Colomb and the Guatemalan man says to him, um, gee, what about the Cold War, the paramilitary groups, the demand for drugs and the hate towards immigrants? In other words, we've got lots of other things to worry about in relationship to you. Guatemala's in the story became hopeless and pure victims, although once it became clear, even when I tried to explain it, um, that the US government couldn't walk into the federal penitentiary, the country's only mental hospital and army barracks in Guatemala City in 1946 without permission, that the Guatemalan government was deeply involved in it just as the physicians in Tuskegee Institute had been with that study, even if obviously there's an enormous power differential. Why governments or professional medical professionals might agree to such a study in their under-resourced areas never gets much attention and certainly not as interesting as the melodrama. The internal racism within Guatemala also got very little initial play except among Guatemalan scholars since many of the people who were in the prisons or were soldiers were Mayan. Much of the story that October then depended on who wrote it and where in the world it went. And it played out with all the melodrama of the bodily physical violations, the US, use of US taxpayer dollars to infect sex workers and send them in a prison to pay, have sex, the power of the US government of global South country, innocent victims, the horror of the abuse of medical research authority at the same time as the US was prosecuting Nazi doctors at Nuremberg and the sexual nature of it all. Again, the emotions of the responses of the government secretaries, my own findings, and those of the people in Guatemala galvanized the press coverage that went across the world within a week and meant I was fielding questions, everyone from the BBC to the Chinese news agency to Al Jazeera. My favorite was when Al Jazeera said to me, this is what the United States does, and thank God I'm quick on my feet. And I said, no, this is what a democracy does when it makes a mistake, it apologizes. Um, at least three filmmakers made contact, that's still going on, and four tort lawyers. Quickly, the heads of the CDC and the NIH also sent a short article out to the Journal of the American Medical Association, published, published that denounced what had happened, explained the protections now in place, don't worry, this will never happen again, right, and tried to assure everyone. Thus, the melodrama of a bad doctor, a differing time, and innocent victims played out against the apology for wrongdoing set in another country and another time. So there's the federal response page. Here's the, there were two reports from the Bioethics Commission, this one, and then another one called Moral Science. The Bioethics Commission report made clear, obviously they had more money and time to do this, the institutional support that had made the study possible and issued a claim of blameworthiness against the doctors who ran it. 
Even though they struggled not to tell the story as a melodrama, the news reports picked up on the number of people who died, even if not because of the research, mind you, and the vividness of the case examples. As you might expect, the lawyers came next. The first lawsuits against the government were dismissed on technicalities, but another lawsuit that I am actually the historical con um, consultant for against Johns Hopkins, Rockefeller University, whose faculty members supported and helped organize the study, and a drug company that provided the penicillin um, is still wending its way through the courts. In conclusion, the scholarly literature on race and melodrama warns us that it will be very difficult ever to escape such a way of telling the story and my own struggles back up this analysis. And now with COVID, Tuskegee too has come back to haunt our imaginations to explain the fears of African-Americans. But by focusing again, just on the melodrama, we lose sight of other important historical steps. And I want to think about the historical lessons of Tuskegee and just think about this for a minute. If there had been the promised 40 acres and a mule after the Civil War, the men's families might not have stayed in Tuskegee and had other economic choices that would have led them off the land. If the men had access to decent health insurance, they would not have been as vulnerable to the offers of free care. If there had been more sex education, condoms available and public health, there would not have been so much syphilis. If racist assumptions about biological differences hadn't existed, the study would not have been done in the first place. And since both black doctors and nurses were central to sustaining the study, we need to remember that just having racially concordant patients' healthcare providers is not enough to protect patients and subjects. So I accept in conclusion that only the first steps to change requires that there be acknowledgement that something horrible has happened. That's what an apology does. I tried in many of the media interviews to remind people of that, that it acknowledges an error when you make an apology, but it doesn't predict or control future behavior. I made an effort to explain the differences between what happened in Tuskegee and Guatemala, even if the seemingly same bad guy doctor linked them, and I absolutely refused to vote on which one was worse. In the end, I think the melodrama reminds us of the horror of the stories, in part, I think, to motivate us to actually begin to think and take action. It cannot stop there. In the face of, quote, moral confusion and disarray, literary critic Linda Williams concludes, melodrama is organized around a paradoxical quest for full articulation of truth and virtue at precisely at that moment when truth and virtue are the most vexed. And yet the stories of these studies in Tuskegee and Guatemala may not seem vexed at all to most who hear about them through rumor, quick media accounts, the emotion of the horrible and abhorrent, and of course, on Saturday Night Live. The melodrama of these two studies helps us to begin to focus our concerns, but whether we just weep or make change, I think, depends on how we understand why these studies happened in the first place and how much the emotion motivates us toward complex changes in social policy, not just in wringing our hands, moaning over simple evil by seemingly bad men and making up more procedural regulations. Melodrama makes for emotive, but ultimately limited theater, I think, and even for a performative apologies. Similarly, I wanna conclude, melodramatic history may get us to pay attention, but it is ultimately a poor guide to making social policy and to achieving justice. Only the real drama can do that. Thank you. Okay, stop share. Okay, I'm back. So um, I wanted to, um, on behalf of Mark and the McClendon, thank you. That was a superb talk. And I think that you did what I most hoped you would do would be not only to go over the context, but the implications and how history really matters okay? and what you do and your discoveries. And I just have to, I love, I absolutely love, love, love the idea that they said just some girl researcher went. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's, that's been <laughs> happening all my life, right? <laughs> no, no, but when you went back after years, after doing one book, understanding the implications, understanding that, and going back to do the kind of careful scrutiny that historians do, right? It's not just a guessing game, it's right. research right. as much as any other basic science. And That's right, exactly. So, right. Right. I'm right. totally, um, I'm going to open it up for questions because I don't work. Um, I have a love fest all afternoon. <laughs> so whoever, just put your um, hand up, like in that little hand up box. It just makes it easier. I'm happy for anybody to field questions or if anything's in the chat. make one comment before we do that. So one of the things I didn't, I didn't add, but I think it's important. Uh, my colleague Evelyn Hammonds and I wrote a piece about this. 
So a lot of people are saying that we're, I mean, I, I do a Google alert on Tuskegee. And so I just, you know, suddenly there's over the last two years, it's just been a ton of it. Um, and mostly it's a lot of journalists writing really quickly. It's because of Tuskegee. And I have been arguing that of course it's not, that if people even use the term like in the SNL thing, it's a code for racism. It's a way to say racism without actually saying it. it's not that people know anything about it or even understand it. It's just that it's a way to speak. And it's more likely what happened to them through their entire lives or what happened to their grandmother last week when they went to the hospital that really matters, not memory of some study um, in the past. So I think it's really important. And I think that the problem with focusing on that history um, doesn't really take into account the structural problems and what's going on now. And so I think it's a way to avoid avoid um, really thinking through the hard stuff, which is how do we treat patients? What kind of access do people have? I mean, it, I once wrote a piece during the debate on the Affordable Care Act in which I argued that um, if the men, because they were using Tuskegee um, to argue against the Affordable Care Act by saying, see, this is what happens when the government gets involved in your health care. And I wrote back and said, no, the study would never have happened if the men had had national health insurance, then they wouldn't have been vulnerable to the offer of free care. So it's a study in what happens when you don't have insurance. That's what it's really about. So, and you know, but here, but here's the important point that you brought up, and I think that's really the essence of this. Melodrama is very powerful, and in a world where we are in a world of popularity, Facebook selling things, that that is so much more. I mean, that's so oh, much yeah. more motivating than the real nuance of the fact that. When the syphilis study was started, there were things we didn't know. And there's a response to where, you know, in some ways, I almost think about it like a legal case. Okay, let's say I was that person. Where would the branch point be that I would have made a difference? I would have done a different thing in the middle of the study that could right. absolutely change. And remember, this is the peri period where you don't do much, you know, I mean, so my dad, who was a solo practicing cardiologist in upstate New York, but he trained at Michael Reese in Chicago. That's where he did his cardiology fellowship. And um, I know it's not there anymore, but in any event, he did a study on, on the use of penicillin and bacterial endocarditis, which at that point was a death sentence. So I said, so dad, what kind of informed consent did you ask the patients for? And he said, I told the patients if they didn't try this new drug, they'd die. Now, Obviously, that would not pass an IRB these days, right? <laughs> but it sums up, I think, in a nice, you know, way, what exactly, you know, I mean, he wasn't lying, you know, but it, it's not exactly what we would count as. So it gives you a sense of sort of what happened. So they didn't think they had to ask these people. They didn't think they would understand, you know, it's just all the things, all the reasons we get the regulations and IRBs after the exposure of all these studies. So how do we talk about syphilis, not syphilis, Tuskegee? To the, how, do you, how do you have a, a conversation about Tuskegee that is impactful? And, you know, how do you take that, that thing? And, um, well, I'm going to read something because I, I think I'm, I'm not speaking it. But um, one of uh, Dr. Reddy wrote, Dr. Reverby, what are your thoughts on the ad campaign that focused on the stories from descendants of the men in the Tuskegee study as a way to encourage people to get the COVID-19 vaccine. I thought that was terrific, actually. I, I really did. I mean, because I thought it made clear that people who had the right to be the most mistrustful of the government were telling other African-Americans, don't be afraid. Um, so I thought that was actually brilliant and really, um, really um, smart. Um, use of that, but it raises this interesting question for those of you who are in clinical practice, like, how do you ask about, you know, the mistrust in a 15 minute encounter, you know, with a patient that you don't know, and, and that's a really tough one to answer, and I'm not sure it can be done individually, I think it has to do with the way we do community outreach, the way we talk um, to patients, who the patients see when they first come in, I mean, obviously, one of the points I made was, you can have racially concordant um, physicians and nurses and still do things incorrectly. There's no guarantee here, though there presumably is at least slight chance that it might be better. But um, I think we need that kind of thing. We need more conversations in the community outside of the clinical moment, because at the clinical moment, I think it's too hard to have that kind of conversation. You can't assume what patients know or don't know unless they raise it. So. I think that's part of the problem. And there's just all the assumptions that get made about African-American patients that drives me 
to distraction, I'm still going to write this essay one of these days. My husband is African American, and the joke in the family, because they're from Virginia, is that they're also related to Jefferson, right? So I'm going to write this essay called My Husband's Thomas Jefferson Problem. Um, because every time he has medical care, they say, well, because you're African American, I'm thinking, nice, related to Jefferson. It all comes from the Jefferson genes, you know, not some long distance African. I mean, how do you know which gene pool, you know, cause whatever genetic basis might be for this? illness. So that's part of the problem is we make all, you know, we have a one drop rule in medicine around, around race. That's a real problem in trying to understand what happens. But to pick up on what you said before, policies and the things we do have huge implications. I mean, we just think about the impact of housing policy during the FDR administration, laying the foundation for, you know, huge social issues in Chicago. So we have to be more thoughtful and more purposeful and think long term about the impact. That's right. Do now on the future. Um, That's right. But I also want to take a piece about the fact that because I think a really important point that I just want you to um, spend a minute on is how do we make sure we do not become cutler? How do we become, you know, better in thinking about the lessons of people who went astray, you know, because yeah. I it's easy to get distracted and you have a study and you're hoping for a trial because a negative right. trial doesn't get published and it could be a career ender. You know? Of course, of course. I think it really requires people um, on various committees that look at this stuff who are outside it, who can help you think it through. And I mean, when I try to explain to people, it's like my favorite quote, actually, when I was doing the research is from... Um, so a, a physician named uh, Joseph Earl Moore, who was like the leading syphilologist at Hopkins in this time period, and he gives this talk in 1954, and he says, and this is by then penicillin's you know getting widely accepted, and the money for VD research is going down, and he says syphilis is going to go away with all its secrets withheld from us, and I thought that was so telling and understandable. So I say to, to physicians when I speak, so suppose you were an HIV researcher, and tomorrow. We had a one pill that if you got it, you know, unprotected says, take this pill and you'll never get it, right? So then all the HIV money that people have gotten for the last 40 years, right, is going to dry up and you're going to have to figure out a new research area. And you're going to be both happy that obviously the disease will go away and then you're going to be really sad that your career is going to have to make a big shift, right? So that's what's going on in the 40s. And that's part of the reason why I think they hold on to Tuskegee because they, they even say that we'll never have a pool of un, you know, untreated people before. I mean, they actually, in the end, didn't have a whole pool of untreated people because a lot of people escaped to antibiotics by hook or by crook. Um, and because if you sneezed in 1950, you got a penicillin shot. But, um, you know, they didn't. So that, that's the word, but I think we have to think about the nature of the way we do research, the pressures to get the article out, all of that, and the corners we end up cutting because of that. I mean, it's understandable. It's almost like two systems, you know, butting heads against each other. Yeah, I just want to comment on something in the chat. First of all, I want to thank you, Susan, for giving us, for giving a talk that was incredibly rich, but also enough time for people to finish up the questions before people have to go to clinic. But one of your colleagues, Carla Kern, said, you know, about dealing with this issue about hesitancy. She says, you listen, and when people ask questions or show hesitancy, you ask about their concerns and experiences, but then you are running pretty behind soon. So right. she also said, when patients ask me if their cancer had been diagnosed soon, if it would be curable, I never know the answer, but I always start with, I wonder that too and see where that lead would go and take them. So it's a way that the- Yeah, exactly. exactly. The other thing is, I swear to God, I'm gonna write an essay because I'm just dealing with apnea issues and I've had six masks, none of which fit. And it keeps saying on my medical record, non-compliant. And I keep going, no, I'm compliant. I tried for six months. It's the machinery that's uncompliant. <laughs> so, you know, it makes me crazy. And so another um, in the chat, where do you see inclinations for melodrama overruling the opportunity for more useful takeaways currently in the coverage of COVID? Yeah. Uh, it's a hard, I mean, you know, it bleeds, it leads kind of problem that we're facing, right? So all the dramatic um, stuff is happening and, and I, I think it's a real problem. And I, I, I mean, I, we were chatting earlier, I have, fam I have a family wedding I'm supposed to be going to and I'm not going because, 
um, one of my nieces is refusing to be vaccinated and I'm just refusing to show up at this wedding um, under those circumstances. So there's just, and people have just dug themselves in so hard that it's really difficult to um, figure out how to talk to them. But I think we just have to keep trying to be really sensible, speaking clearly. I mean, I've really been impressed with some of the medical physicians, the physicians who have spoken on COVID, particularly Ashish Jha from um, Brown University, who seems to be the star, at least was early on, I thought was really, you know, gave very clear answers really quickly, not a lot of folderol, not a lot of medical blah, 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 you know, and was really clear. So I think that makes a big difference. But I think, you know, we're struggling against you know, just the the scientific ignorance uh, and the leftover, I mean, I, in some ways I'm help respond. I mean, I'm a 60s kid. So, you know, we're responsible for that. Don't trust anybody over 30, you know, question every institution, you know, the government lies. I mean, you know, I was part of making that possible, right? So now we're reaping a particular kind of mistrust, you know, that we engendered, you know. Well, listen, my friend, um, any last questions before I give um, Dr. Reverby a little downtime before she meets with the ethics fellows this afternoon? But I want to also um, say again, on behalf of the McLean Center and the University of Chicago, you really embody that lecture embodied what we most hope would be uh, part of this lecture series is to see history with new eyes and to look at the data in a thoughtful way. And hopefully, my, my big hope is maybe down the road as a result of exactly the kind of things that you've been studying and talk about, that we have a more nuanced understanding and maybe we can plan for a better future. So I sure hope so. Half of all of us, we really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry again. I'm not going out for a beer with you afterward, but uh, another time. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Just a quick, a quick word, yeah. uh, Susan and, and, and the fellows. Uh, we'll, we'll regather at, at uh, 1.30. Oh, okay, tomorrow. in a half an hour. Okay, terrific. I have that other link. Thank there'll you. Be, there'll be a Zoom available on, on, on your... Yeah, yeah I've got it too. Okay, thank you. Thank you again for the chance. Nice thank meeting you, you all. Bye. Bye. Bye.